Well, welcome to our, uh, our webinar on uh, the, I guess, making the best use of virtual assistants. Um, about three or four years ago, I actually read the uh, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, which is is quite a quite a useful book to read. Um, and in it, he talked about using virtual assistants as a way of uh, improving your productivity and freeing up time. Um, about the same time, I had a colleague, Andrew Leinig in Adelaide, who was uh, had employed a virtual assistant and was a raving and was just raving about how uh, how good they were. So I started investigating it further. I'd been selectively using uh, secretarial services and stuff for some jobs uh, around my business, but it was probably an unsatisfying experience for me for a variety of reasons. Um, my business is also I have I've structured it so that I actually don't want a lot of employees, and I'm not interested in uh, having a full-time employee. And we might talk about about some of that in a while. Um, but uh, so I, I, a virtual assistant um, appealed to me. So I tracked down Ray, and Ray's logged on with us today. Um, and uh, so Ray's my virtual assistant. Started with Ray on a part-time basis. She was uh, so worked worked out so well for me that we've now been together for about three years. We're on a full-time basis, um, and it's, it's a great relationship that that I think uh, suits both of us. Um, about twelve years ago, uh, uh, twelve years ago, twelve months ago, I actually engaged uh, another another assistant, Chris, and uh, Chris also works full-time for me. I'm going to talk a little bit about what they do for me in a second. Um, as a result of, of I guess, engaging um, virtual assistants, I get a number of questions from people all the time about, well, what do they do and how does it all work and how do you find them and all that sort of stuff. So I thought this webinar would be um, a, a good way of, of just getting into those sorts of things. So um, we're, uh, um, that's where we're heading today. So let's... Uh, Let's start talking about some of the key questions. All right. So, what's a virtual assistant? Um, the uh, the dictionary description is that they're uh, a virtual assistant provides a range of online administrative, secretarial, and clerical support, as well as creative and or technical services for clients. So, you know, um, my experience is they you can have a virtual assistant to do just about anything for you. These people are usually home based and they can be located anywhere in the world with an internet connection. So, um, you know, uh, be involved, you know, Australia, wherever you like. Um, I've actually worked with virtual employees in Bangladesh, India, New Zealand, the Philippines and Poland. Um, and both my current VAs are, are located in the Philippines um, and lots of good reasons for that. Um, I guess uh, they often have no physical contact with the, with virtual assistants, so it really is an electronic uh, relationship, and it works uh, fairly well for lots of people. Um, and uh, you can employ them on a range of basis, on a project basis, on a casual basis, on a part-time basis, or a full-time basis. So um, now I've employed both Ray and Chris on a full-time basis, and that works for us, but I've also used other people with other skill sets uh, for on a project basis or or different ways. Um, you know, they do a range of different things. So Ray does a lot of stuff for me with uh, on research. She writes all my blog articles and uh, for a number of websites and does that for us. She's actually helped me co-author a book and does done all the research and a lot of the writing in that book, which has been fantastic. Um, she does secretarial duties, typing up notes from clients and workshops and that sort of stuff. Manages my CRM and just does a whole heap of, uh, of sort of smaller tasks. Chris, on the other hand, Chris is my uh, webmaster, and Chris has probably logged on today as well, but he's got the flu at the moment, so he may not have. Um, Chris manages sort of five odd websites for me, does um, SEO type work for them. He does some client work. We're starting to develop websites for clients at the moment, and he also um, pulls together our flyers and newsletters and all that sort of stuff that you would have seen as, say, part of the promotion for these uh, for these webinars. They're both based in the Philippines, and happy to say they both uh, both survived the recent uh, typhoon over there um, unharmed, which was which was really good, and their families are safe as well. So that's uh, that's particularly pleasing. Just going to take you through some, uh, I guess some some frequently asked questions um, that I get asked, and I sort of sat down and went back through the questions that I've been asked over time. So what sort of jobs they can do? They can do anything that you like, really, as long as it's virtual. So it's anything that doesn't require face-to-face -face contact or um, them doing physical work for you, they can do. So 
you know, they can do web design, web development. Um, I've used them for developing my iPhone apps. So I've got three iPhone apps that, that, they, um, that they've worked on and they can do. Um, I've used them for translation services for my apps. So I've done, I've used lots of people in lots of different ways. Graphic design, you know, detailed graphical design, all that sort of stuff. So lots of people can do lots of different things for you. How do I communicate with them? Um, email is the primary method of communication, but I've found certainly with uh, with Chris and Ray that um, we use email a bit, but um, uh, instant message chat stuff is also good for so that instant contact um, and video conferencing, you know, Skype, or I use one called VC. I'll talk about some of these tools later. They've all been really, really good. How do you pay them? Um, if you've engaged them through some of the websites we'll talk about in a minute, um, then uh, you'll often pay them through those sites, um, which are quite good. They're particularly if you use them for on a project basis, you might pay them for those sites. Um, alternatively, um, you know, I pay Ray and Chris through uh, either PayPal or Western Union. Um, Western Union is about instant fees, whereas PayPal um, transfers into bank accounts. Um, so I've used both those uh, for, for paying different people. So really, any electronic payment methods that you've both got access to um, are important. Uh, how much do they cost? Um, this varies, obviously, depending on the location and, and the prevailing rates in that location. So don't forget, you're actually employing people uh, and paying them at rates in their, in their local area. Um, so you're paying them rates that are, are relevant for the other jobs that they could have in that area rather than uh, equivalent weight. But typically, uh, Australian-based virtual assistants uh, rates are somewhere between $30 to $75 an hour. Um, some of them could be higher than that. Um, and your overseas virtual assistants can be you know, down at 2 or $3 an hour and up to $30 an hour, depending on the tasks they want. The jurisdiction they're in, you know, where they're located, and those sorts sorts of things. So, um, it all it all varies, and uh, it all depends on what they're doing. Um, and that's something that you can negotiate. Um, the question I get asked all the time is, "What well, aren't they taking jobs that could stay in Australia?" I guess in some cases that's yes. Um, but uh, you know, also know we're living in a global economy at the moment, and uh, you know, not only are people manufacturing products offshore and doing a hype of things, but we're now seeing services and things delivered by people overseas that, that were previously delivered here in Australia. Um, in my case, no, they they haven't taken jobs from anybody. Um, I, I just simply my business is structured the way that I they, I wouldn't pay somebody to do uh, Australian wages to do some of the work that um, or the vast majority of the work that I get Ray and Chris to do. Um, the uh, um, so you know I, I guess. Um, really there was no job to take so I, I'd either wouldn't pay somebody and I would keep doing it my, myself rather than pay you know 40 50 dollars an hour for some of the jobs because the value is not there for somebody to, for me to pay somebody 200 dollars to write a blog article or, or something for me um, I also see it's a goodwill initiative to work with uh, people in other countries um, and assisting people you know living in countries less fortunate than us um, you know and, uh, and I know certainly, certainly you know that um, that working from home saves Ray a lot of commuting time, so he doesn't have to transport to uh, transport himself to other areas. It gives her time for a family, spending time with her children, and um, on gives her an opportunity to earn wages that are more than comparable with uh, what she can earn back home in her country. So, in in a way, um, where you know it, it's a win win for everybody. Um, I guess um, if if you feel strongly about that you don't want to take jobs out of Australia, that's fine. You don't have to employ an overseas virtual assistant. And there are plenty of Australian uh, people who are operating as virtual assistants at the moment. And in the resources page, uh, when we talk about stuff, we've got some links to Australian websites where you can actually track down a virtual assistant, Australian-based virtual assistant uh, to help you. All right. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about pros and cons of working with a virtual assistant, and then about how do we actually uh, how do we actually find one. Um, first up, pros. I guess one of the big pros of, of a virtual assistant um, is that uh, there are no real additional costs to employment apart from the cost of the VA themselves. So you don't have to you know um, buy extra computer equipment or office space or do other things. And you know, as I'm a home based worker. Um, that helps me. All right, I'm cutting in and out. I'm sorry. Um, is it? Yeah, obviously my voice keeps fading. Sorry about that. I'll try and 
uh, kind of, please let me know if it's uh, if it's um, not working. Um, the uh, pros and cons, like I said, no additional costs. So um, often you can uh, um, uh, you can engage somebody at no additional ex expense to yourself, so you don't have to have offices and all that sort of stuff. The um, that's good. Thanks, Jared. Uh, thanks for the feedback. The the flexibility, you know, they're very flexible in terms of, of what you can do. Um, I found the time zone thing for me um, is really quite good. Um, the Philippines are sort of where Ray and Chris are, we're sort of two hours behind Australian time, uh, which is really quite good. So it means I can office, often finish up stuff at the end of the day, forward them on to Chris and Ray to do, have some tasks to wrap up at the end of the day, and they can often get them done for me. Um, and back to me um, on the same day, which is always good. Um, that whole, uh, you know, uh, thing I said about about uh, helping other people who are less fortunate for you, I think is a, um, a nice part of the process. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Australia, we're very lucky with what, what we have and uh, other countries don't have the same luxury, so that's a good thing. The cons, you know, one of the big problems is, you know, no physical tasks. So, you know, the, the challenge for, for me sometimes is, you know, I would just love to be able to have somebody to go and do some photocopying or pick up some, uh, you know, pick up some reports or, or do some other things. So there's no physical tasks. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. So everything is electronic or online. Um, the other thing, you know, is uh, if you're going to have somebody who in, an, in another country, they have different holidays, they have different climatic events, uh, there's different events in you know, different times of the year and all that sort of stuff. And you've just got to have up a calendar so that you know when they're available and when they're going to be doing things and everything else. Um, and uh, we seem to have worked out a system that works for, it, for us. The other challenge is that it's internet access dependent um, and at times the um, at times, the internet uh, services in some of these other countries, uh, particularly some of the third world countries, it's not particularly good. Although, you know, sometimes I compare it to the steam powered internet that I have here in uh, Bundaberg, and um, um, I think Chris and Ray often have better access than I do. I do. Um, but that's a problem. So, no, inter uh, no internet access, no access to your virtual assistant, um, which can be a challenge. Um, this is uh, um, the other thing is you know language customs and understanding. So some of the uh, um, um, other virtual assistants that I've worked with uh, in my time, you know English is not necessarily a first language for them. Uh, sometimes it's a second or third language, and therefore you've got to be very direct and very focused uh, with your communication. Um, and slightly different customs and understanding. So using colloquial terms and that sort of stuff is is often uh, um, not a um, not a um, not I guess it's something you've got to get your head head around and and time zones can also be a um, a, a problem um, because uh, they're not always there when you want them to be so you know um, now you know I find that's not a problem for me but I, I know that um, um, when I've worked with people in other time zones, um, then uh, sometimes that's a real challenge because they're sort of eight or nine hours behind or whatever and getting access to them quickly can, can be a problem. But that's all stuff that's relatively easy to sort out. How do I go about finding um, finding my virtual assistants? Um, I guess the uh, simple process, this was a process developed by a colleague of mine, Andrew Leinig. Um, really quite a simple process. Um, first thing you want to do is develop a role profile or job description. Um, and uh, and that's something that you probably should do anyhow. So get a clear understanding of what it is that you're looking for from your virtual assistant. You can then advertise on, on sites like onlinejobs.ph or similar sites. And uh, some of the other sites that, that were listed in the resources are things like uh, Virtual Staff Finder, Freelancer or Elance or Odesk, um, they're all good. Um, Freela Freelancer and uh, Elance and some of those sites are certainly more geared to um, shorter project um, based uh, consultancies um, and getting people on board for that rather than long term uh, relationships, but um, you can do both through them. The, if you're looking particularly for a Filipino virtual assistant, 
um, onlinejobs.ph is, is excellent um, and uh, that's good. Australian based um, uh, sites, um, um, virtuallyyours.com.au, the virtual assistant australia.net.au, and virtual assistant.net.au are all sites, and they're all in the materials that we'll send through to you. But there's lots of opportunities to type virtual, virtual assistant into uh, Google, and you get a whole heap of stuff. So develop a role profile, use that role profile to advertise um, on, uh, on an appropriate website or to go and find somebody. You need to have some simple criteria, so do this in advance. Have some simple criteria set up for how you might um, evaluate your your, um, your candidates. So five to seven criteria is what I that what I would uh, recommend. Um, use a simple decision matrix, um, and uh, you know all you're going to do is rate them out of ten in each of those criteria or something else. So. Um, you know, decision matrix. If you type decision matrix into Google, will give you some good answers. I've also got a there's a an app I've developed on decision matrix that you can use for it. But really, you can just have a table that you've got some criteria and your your applicants across the top, either in a spreadsheet or somewhere else. So get some simple criteria. Think through the criteria that you're going to use to determine who you don't want to have. Um, I found that I got uh, quite a lot of uh, responses to um, my first ad. Um, so I got about, I think I got about a hundred responses for for Ray's job, um, and I and I got some, uh, I just got some simple criteria. Um, oh, sorry, some, I got people to some simple processes and got people to demonstrate their abilities. So I just asked them to do some simple tasks. So everybody who responded, I had a templated email that I sent back to them. that just said, thank you very much for your application. Um, I need to get a little bit of information from you. Um, and I asked them to fill out a simple survey which put their information into a format that I wanted it, so name, you know, rank serial number stuff. And then I asked them to do three simple tasks. I, uh, in this case, I was looking for somebody with strong um, ability to write um, and research blog articles for me. So I gave them uh, a newspaper article and said, I want you to write me um, a short blog article on that, a 100, 200 word blog article um, based on that article. Um, type up some of my writing from my handwriting, so I scan some handwriting and send it to them, and send me an example of any other work that you might have done. Those simple criteria culled out about 90% of the applicants, which was quite good, um, and I got back to 10 finalists, and of those 10 finalists, I then, uh, I then put them through my criteria, and of those, I selected the top three, and you know I was gonna conduct a Skype interview with the final three, but uh, once I spoke to Ray, I found her to be really quite excellent. So I just said, hey, I can't be bothered talking to anybody else. Why don't I go with you? So that was good. And then prepare a, um, once you've selected your person, you need to prepare a, a simple employment agreement. Um, I mean, for me, that was just a simple email explaining the, um, you know, the terms and conditions we'd agreed to. Um, but you may want to have a more formal agreement as part of your organisation. So um, that's my simple process. Get a job profile, be clear what you're asking for, use that profile to advertise, use the profile as well to work out the criteria that you're going to select people on, get them to demonstrate their abilities with some simple tests. So um, I, that was really important. I did the same thing when uh, with uh, when recruiting Chris for a, for a web thing. I got people to, to do some simple um, things that would demonstrate they had the capability to do what I wanted them to do. And I got some fantastic people out of it. Um, Interview the final three, and then um, and then just document it all into some sort of employment agreement. A fairly simple process. The key one there is to get people to demonstrate their ability for you. Okay. Um, so that's a simple process for that. In terms of, uh, in, I guess, improving uh, your effectiveness, uh, these are some of the tools. I mean, we talked about these in the uh, in the productivity improvement webinar we ran uh, just a couple of weeks ago, but. You know, you've got to have some collaboration tools. So remember, um, these people, uh, you know, can, will be remote from you, whether they're in Australia or elsewhere. So you need to have some tools where you can collaborate with them. So email is obviously important, um, and uh, it's an important way to do things. The challenge I found with email is if you're not careful, you can end up with lots and lots of emails going backwards and forwards. And uh, if you're like me and you already have a lot of emails every day, that just adds to the traffic. Um, 
and uh, makes things a little bit more more difficult. Um, down at the bottom, uh, that area that, of the collaboration tools um, graphic there, there's a, a product called Bitrix24. Bitrix24 is a, solo, a social collaboration tool, so it's a social intranet. And uh, it's an online web-based um, service. I think for up to 12 people it's free, which allows you to set up projects to communicate backwards and forwards um, by um, instant message, by uh, like a social media type feed. Um, and it's really quite good. So it's worth, it's worth sorting out if you've got a little bit of a distributed workforce. So it's uh, really quite good. Zoho has some great products as well. They have an um, uh, amazing range of products actually, but they have a chat pro product and also a meetings product that you might be able to use as well and get some advantage out of it. We also use video conferencing. So Skype's the, the typical one. Um, and that's useful. You can actually instant message on Skype as well and use it to transfer files around. So it's quite a useful one. Um, I also use a product called VC. That's spelled V S E E, and um, and it's a video com conferencing uh, tool as well. Uses a bit lower bandwidth um, and has better screen sharing capability than Skype, um, but a good product as well. So you need some collaboration tools. So you need to work out how you're going to collaborate with these people and work with your team because you need to work closely with them. In terms of task management is probably the next really important thing. So you know, you've got to be able to talk about things, but you've also got to be able to manage tasks and, and, and processes. So a couple of tools here, um, we've talked about these before, um, Kanban Flow or Trello. I actually use Trello. Um, these are in the resources page as well. So that's page four of the, um, of the book, uh, the workbook. But um, both good task management tools. I think Trello is slightly better in that it allows you to have instant messages around uh, tasks and other stuff. So it's it's quite a useful um, useful tool. If you want to step it up a bit and have a bit more around project management, so a bit more of a project management structure, you can use Basecamp HQ. Or, um, Basecamp's um, a really quite a good project management tool. And Zoho Projects is also uh, quite a powerful tool for managing projects. So it'll do Gantt charts and all those sorts of things and also allow you to have um, real-time conversations around project tasks and those sorts of things. Um, I find for most activities, it's probably a bit of overkill. Um, there are also other options like uh, like uh, like GQs um, down the bottom. So it's um, in the things as well, um, in the resources as well. So that's, uh, think of ways to manage manage your tasks. You may be able to use Outlook. So um, I guess the basic principles I look for are, do we have online access? So that's either web or VPNs or, you know, cloud. So um, how can you give um, shared access to, to uh, all the things you want? And you may have a server that allows you to have remote logins from people and you may be able to use um, the tools that are already available on that through Microsoft SharePoint or something else. Um, in terms of business tools, um, I guess Google Docs is, uh, is, is something that uh, is really useful because it's a uh, um, an online um, suite of Office pro products like uh, Word and Excel and PowerPoint. So it allows you to actually uh, collaborate live on online with things. So we use a combination of, uh, of normal standard Office pro uh, products with Google Docs for things that we want to keep live and uh, we don't have to worry about version control and all that sort of stuff. So that works really, really well. Um, Evernote um, is a great tool. You can share notebooks on Evernote and uh, it's a great tool to use in this situation as well. Um, for those of you in business with a CRM, you want a CRM that either enables you to um, share it with uh, your virtual assistants and um, so some allow you to, to actually set up a system on their desktop and they can use it. Um, I've gone to a web-based CRM. Um, the one I'm using is um, Zoho CRM, but there are some other good ones, Capture ones, some others are really quite good as well, as well as Salesforce and, and others. Um, you pay for those on a per user basis. The other great tool is my LiveScribe pen, and we talked about this last time. It's an electronic pen that actually uh, records all all your written, handwritten notes and those sorts of things. And I, I use those uh, to take notes and flick them onto Ray and Chris for, um, for tools we need to do. So that's really important. The other thing you might want to think about is file storage and access. So, you know, how are you going to share files and those sorts of things that you need to do? Um, we use Dropbox a bit for that, but you could easily use Google Drive 
Um, and there's another service I believe called Mosey, which I don't use, but is, apparently is quite good. So Mosey is M-O-Z-I. So you can use different services for different things. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to be able to collaborate effectively, share information, share files, all those sort of things in order to, um, I guess, help your, uh, help, help your team um, uh, move on. So, you know, if you're um, having challenges with any of these with communication when they're far away and uh, understanding what people are up to, then uh, the process will become very frustrating for you. So at a minimum, you need to, you know, use email and probably Skype um, and the instant messaging on Skype. You need some sort of task management um, tool. So whether you can do that through Outlook and SharePoint or you need a tool like Trello or Kanban Flow, you know, they're free, so you can actually use those or very cost effective. Um, and then you probably need, uh, you know, um, to understand any business tools you might want them to share. But, um, you know, you may get away with just uh, having office files transferred around and those sorts of things and not have to worry about file storage and using Google Docs or other things. But at a minimum, you need some collaboration tools and you need some task management tools to stay on top of things. All right, so... Um, in terms of leverage, you know, there's there's lots of different ways you can you can uh, get leverage from a virtual assistant, um, and uh, I'm going to get you now to think if you've got your workbook there. I'd like you to think about you know what are the three steps you're going to take away from today on how you can uh, use a virtual assistant in your business. Um, Tim Ferriss in in his book talked about uh, people who actually had a job actually employing a virtual assistant of their own and um, and, and using the time they freed up to actually work on other business interests and other things. So um, he talked about using it in a, in a, in a job. Um, I'm talking about using it in your business. So how can you use a, a virtual assistant in your business to give you some leverage? And the important thing to think about is what are you going to do with the time you free up? So if you free up time by having somebody else do it, how can you get a maximum economic return on that time by focusing on something productive that only you can do in your business? So in a way, I think about it saying, how do you outsource the 10 or the $20 jobs to somebody in order for you to focus on, on the 100 or the 200 or the $500 jobs in your business? So that's the important, the important element to think of. Um, so take two seconds to think about it. What are three steps you're going to take away from today to explore how you might use a virtual assistant in your business? Um, make a bit of sense? So, um, then in summary, I guess um, important thing is to think about how how will you leverage your time using a virtual assistant? Um, and um, what are you going to do with that extra time? So how can you make the best use of, of your time by engaging somebody else to do some, some jobs for you in your business? And it doesn't matter where those people are located. What would you have them do? So what are the things that you would get your virtual assistant to do for you? you know, what are some of the tasks that, that, that you can use? And then can you pull enough of them together to have either a full-time position, a part-time position, or possibly just somebody on an ad hoc basis that does work for you? Um, develop a job description or at least a, a task outline of the things that you'd like them to do. Once you're there, then you might want to work out, uh, you know, how to go and find them. There's lots of good websites. Um, the resources are there to do it. Um, and you can set up, you then need just make sure you put the right systems in place so that you collaborate and communicate well with them and so that you manage the tasks. Now we're going to send you a, uh, I guess, a recorded version of this. So um, we've been recording it and we'll send you a, uh, and a resources list in the next day or so. So thanks very much for that. Um, and um, we've got some time for some questions before we do. Um, the next webinar is going to be on building a business model for your webinar. Um, it's going to be on November the 27th, Wednesday night again. Same sort of time frame as this one. Um, you know, thinking about what's a business model and how do I use it? You know, where can I get some leverage to take on the competition and how can I make it a reality in our business? So thinking about your business model is really about how do we structure our business and how do we make money in our business and how do we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace? So that's going to be our next webinar. So I look forward to seeing you then. Um, also, uh, 
you know, you've all heard about the uh, the horrible typhoon that's been through the Philippines. I would uh, today's a, a free event, but I'd really um, encourage you uh, if you found it of value to uh, go to the Red Cross and donate some money. There's over 10 million people have been impacted uh, um, directly by the by the typhoon. Um, many thousands of people have been killed, and um, um, certainly. Uh, more than half a million people in immediate need of food and water. So anything you can do there would, would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. Look forward to seeing you at one of our future events and hopefully you've got some value out of it. Have a great week. Bye.